Okay, folks, let's get started. Happy Monday. Everybody had a big weekend studying biochemistry, I hope. Uh, so we have an exam in here on Friday. Uh, the material for the exam will be whatever I cover through today. And if I don't get all the way through it, which I probably won't, then I will finish it up on Wednesday, but that will be on the, on the final. So that whatever I cover after today will be on the final. Okay. Um, I haven't yet gotten a room for a uh, review session, but I am tentatively planning it for Wednesday evening. I know from my experience last time, people didn't like 5 o'clock, they liked 6 o'clock better. Does that make sense? Okay, it'll probably be about 6.15, I think. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, announce that on Wednesday and probably also post it on the web page. So hopefully that will work for everybody. All right, so as I said, whatever I cover through today is uh, on the exam. Everything after today is then on the final. Well, let's see, last time I finished uh, talking about showing you some videos of the replication process. And the replication process is a pretty elaborate one. Um, I, uh, there are, in fact, a few people showed me various uh, videos that they had found. And there are uh, some interesting videos out there. I still haven't found the definitive uh, video of DNA replication, uh, partly because it's a fairly intricate process. And we will see a similar thing. Uh, when we go to look at translation. Translation is also a very, very intricate process and there aren't any really good videos that are out there that I think are 100% accurate. Um, what I want to talk about today are uh, a couple of things relevant to uh, replication, uh, start, how replication gets started, and how replication occurs in eukaryotes. And I think what happens in eukaryotes is one of the most interesting uh, phenomena uh, in terms of biological implications. And I'll say some more about that as we get going through it. So um, one of the things I didn't, uh, I haven't said so far is, well, you know that to start DNA replication, you have to have a primer. But I didn't tell you anything about how the cell decides where to put that primer. So remember that we're still talking at this point about bacterial DNA replication, and we're talking about a circular chromosome. So that circular chromosome goes all the way around, okay? And so it, it <clears throat> excuse me, it basically uh, ultimately uh, runs into another end and it stops. So that's a very different phenomenon than what happens in eukaryotes because eukaryotes have linear chromosomes. As we shall see, it's a very, very different kind uh, of a process. So for prokaryotes, um, what happens is replication starts at an origin. In fact, replication starts at an origin for any type of DNA replication that we're talking about. So by definition, the origin is a sequence of DNA where replication starts. Okay, not surprising. And it's not totally surprising that the cell being a control, the control freak that it is, would want to always start in the same place, and it does. And in E. coli, uh, the uh, E. coli replication starts at an origin called ORIC, O-R-I, and then capital C. So ORIC is the <coughs> excuse me is the E. coli origin of replication. And you may remember I said it starts out from there, it goes bidirectionally, and then ends up uh, up above and finishes um, at a termination site, actually, that we, I won't talk about. <clears throat> and so what I want to do now is say a little bit about the orchestration of how that uh, very first replication uh, occurs. Well, this is a sort of a, a zoomed-in view of the um, E. coli or E. C. Um, uh, origin. And what we see is something interesting. We see uh, some binding sites for a DNA binding protein called DNA A. And DNA A is a uh, protein that recognizes sequences that are in this origin. So these are some specific sequences that it's recognizing. And I want you to pay attention to this tandem array of 13 mers. A 13 mer simply means it's 13 nucleotide long, not nucleotides long, and a, and a tandem array means there's several of them. So we have several repeats of 13 nucleotides long. And this set of repeats is rich in ATs. Okay? So when we go, or not we, when E. coli goes to replicate its 
genome. In fact, there's the sequence right there, GATCT, and meaning any nucleotide, TTN, TTTT. So you can see it's very rich in A's and T's. There's only two G's, uh, or one G and one C in that uh, entire sequence. Here's what happens when DNA A binds those sequences. It forms a hexamer, as you can see here. And the other one I think only showed four, but there's actually six, at least six, at least five sequences. I think there's actually even more sequences than that that DNA A can bind. But in any event, when it forms, uh, when it binds these sequences, it forms this sort of contorted-looking DNA molecule wrapped around these proteins. And the wrapping of the DNA around these proteins, which you guys have learned already from topology, is when you start winding things up, you're going to create some strains because we have a circular chromosome, if you remember. So this winding up of this DNA molecule with this protein causes some strain, and the strain is felt most strongly where these tandem arrays of A's and T's are. And the way that the DNA molecule responds to that strain is the A's and T's actually unwind just a little bit. They unwind. So instead of having things in a nice helix, they've unwound, so the strands are rather separated from each other in the region where those A's and T's are. Well, that opening provides a place for the next protein to come in. Actually, I don't have a figure for that. The next protein to come in, which is the DNA B and C complex. Now, DNA B, you've already heard of before. DNA B is known as helicase. So helicase comes in as one of the very first proteins. It comes in with another protein called C. And it starts that unwinding process so that we can now assemble, or the E. coli can now assemble the replication complex and start replication. So this process allows an opening to occur for DNA B, the helicase, to come in do a little unwinding and allow the assembly of that replication complex so the replication can start. That replication complex, of course, will include the primase and all the other proteins that I talked about last time that are necessary for DNA replication to occur. Okay, makes sense? You're a quiet group today? The, the, the exam blues got you? Okay. So that's uh, what happens. There's a lot of various other things that come in there, not surprisingly. Um, if we look at the DNA polymerases um, that uh, are out there, I'm not going to talk about all these. And no, I'm just showing you this for information. I'm not expecting you're going to memorize anything out of this. But you do see some differences um, in uh, the function of each of these. Uh, DNA polymerase 2 I haven't talked about. But DNA polymerase 2 is a polymerase um, that is involved mostly in fixing errors in the DNA. This table is also a little uh, inaccurate in that there are actually five different polymerases in E. coli. The first three have numbers. The other, the other two have names. And they, they do functions that we won't be talking about here. As I said, the most important polymerase in E. coli is uh, E. coli uh, DNA polymerase 3, which is a complex uh, of other protein, of a whole bunch of proteins that come together and give that replication function. It's the primary enzyme of DNA uh, synthesis. Okay. Um, we look at eukaryotic polymerases. <clears throat> we see several, and again, there are more than what are listed here um, in eukaryotes, but these are the most commonly uh, discussed ones. Uh, e. coli, I'm, I'm sorry, eukaryotic DNA polymerase alpha, it's polymerase beta, and polymerase delta. Um, all play important roles, and the roles of eukaryotic DNA polymerases are still being unraveled. It's not completely clear in every case uh, what the function of each polymerase is. DNA polymerase delta is what's uh, thought to be the primary enzyme of DNA synthesis in eukaryotes. And it's polymerase delta that also has that beta clamp-like protein that I described before that holds the polymerase on. And that beta clamp, as I said, in eukaryotes is called PCNA. OK, well, I'm not going to talk about the individual polymerases, as I said, in uh, eukaryotes. But I do want, you, I do want to say a, a bit about the replication process. So eukaryotic cells have a much bigger challenge than prokaryotic cells do. Eukaryotes have to coordinate their actions. We've talked about signaling, helping to coordinate things. 
And we want all of the eukaryotic cells in an organism pulling their ores at the same time. Okay? We don't want to have uh, each cell for itself, which is what we have in a prokaryotic situation. So one of the controls that's, that eukaryotic cells have is what's called a cell cycle. And I'm sure you've seen cell cycle in your cell biology classes before. Uh, cell cycle consists of a mitotic phase uh, where the cell actually divides. It consists of a, an interphase called G1 that precedes uh, the synthesis phase. So it's in the synthesis phase where uh, DNA replication occurs. And then a, a sort of a resting phase again before mitosis actually occurs. And these uh, phases of the cycle that you see on the screen are each controlled. They're actually distinct places and distinct places where there are proteins that play roles in determining whether the cell goes forward into the next phase of the cycle. Now one of the proteins that plays a role in here, I'm going to talk about it uh, later in the lecture, is uh, P53. And P53 is a fascinating protein. P53 uh, plays a very important role in what I call quality control of replication. And P53, um, as I will describe later, controls the transition from G1 to S. P53 makes sure that cells are, in fact, uh, ready for synthesis. In other words, that the DNA, one of the functions it has is making sure that the DNA is ready to go and ready to be replicated. And I'll say more about that uh, as I get forward. Okay, um, but before I talk about that, I want to talk about the problem of telomeres. So telomeres are, uh, first of all, I need to define what that is for you. If we look at each of the chromosomes that you have or I have or any eukaryotic organism has, what we discover is that the chromosomes, in contrast to the cir circular chromosomes we saw in E. coli, they are linear. Now, as I said, when we go to replicate a circular uh, chromosome, what we see is that things go all the way around, and then it ultimately runs into the end of another DNA molecule, so that the, the cycle is sort of self-completing, which is very, very good. Okay? That means that that very first primer that was used to start that replication can ultimately be removed by a polymerase coming all the way back around and removing it. We don't have that option in eukaryotes. Okay, now this is always a little hard for students to envision, and I'll, rem I'll remind you why this is the case. Okay? The reason this is a problem is that all DNA replication requires a primer. And all DNA replication only occurs in the five prime to three prime direction. <clears throat> Those two principles are why what, what, what I'm going to describe to you actually happens. Okay, now I'll show you a figure, and well, actually, I'll, I'll show you the figure first. This figure is a dumb figure, by the way, so I don't like this figure. I like my own figure, high quality art. Okay, here is a eukaryotic linear chromosome. Maybe this is your chromosome number three, for example. It could be any of the chromosomes. They have linear ends. So if we start replication at a linear end, what do we have to do? Well, we, we have a primase. So primase comes along, and it lays down an RNA primer which I have done in red. It doesn't show very well in red there. That happens at each end of the chromosome. Now, in contrast to E. coli, which only has one origin, you have thousands within your chromosome. Fortunately, you have one at the end of each. OK. Now, this replication starts, and we have a little RNA primer that's shown there in red. We go through, and the product of this, so we, instead of having two strands, we now have four strands. So I said, OK, let's follow this top one and see what happens to it. Well, here's the top one that we had. And uh, if we look at uh, the replication here, we start replication. OK, so we've got a three prime end, so that means we start a five prime end here. We're going to replicate this all the way through. And we replicate it all the way through, except for the fact that when we get down to the RNA, which is down on here, the DNA polymerase can't copy it. The DNA polymerase can't copy it because DNA polymerase cannot copy RNA and make DNA. That means there's always going to be a tiny gap that's, that's unfixed or unreplicated at the, uh, in each cycle of eukaryotic DNA replication. So when replication starts going back, uh, so when replication starts going back this way, it's going to start at the end of this three prime, and it's going to go that direction, meaning we've lost 
this sequence at the end. Now this sequence at the end is, is part of what's called the telomere. Okay? Every time your cells replicate, you lose a tiny portion of the linear end of your chromosomes. And the longer you do that, the shorter your chromosomes get. So my chromosomes are shorter than all of your chromosomes. Because my chromosomes have gone through many more cycles of replication than your chromosomes have gone through. Okay? That's absolutely true. So every time I go through replication, I'm going to lose a little bit. Do I, anybody want me to explain more about this before I say more? That's the first time if I ever said that that I ever got it 100% clear. Yes? So doesn't DNA polymerase 2 take out primers? So DNA polymerase 1 uh, would take out primers in E. coli, and we have things that will take out primers, but if we take out the primer, then we lose, we, we've lost it, right? There's nothing to start a new one. So the fact that the DNA polymerase cannot start something without a primer means that we're always going to lose that little piece on the end, whether we chew it out or whether we just do it like I said here and it just simply is unable to replicate. Either way, we lose that little sequence at the end. Everybody with me there? Question? Uh, thus, RNA primers shorten linear chromosomes with each, each round of replication. Is um... <laughs> let me look at it on here. I can't read it on there. Um, is encountered where, where the RNA prime is, where the RNA primer the RNA uh, primer is encountered. Okay. All right. So now that means that um, my chromosomes are getting shorter. Your chromosomes are getting shorter. All right. The telomere is a sequence at the end. So the telomere is being affected by this that is repeated thousands of times over and over and over. It's about a seven nucleotide long sequence. Thousands of repeats of seven nucleotides over and over and over and over and over. You can think of it as a dummy sequence. Why do we have that? Well, the reason we have that is because we're going to lose something each time. If we had at the end a critical gene and we started chewing in on that, what's going to happen to the cell? Question? No. No, Tata box is something else. Okay? So if we had a critical gene, we don't want to have it right there in the end because that cell is not going to last very long if we have that. So we have this telomere as a buffer, giving the cell something to lose a little bit of each time. Eventually, the cell is going to run out of telomere, though. When it runs out of telomere, it is going to start chewing into essential genes, and that cell is going to die. Now, some people think, and there's actually some interesting experimental evidence for it, that the longer your telomeres are when you're born, and by the way, you grow your telomeres starting with being a fertilized egg. I'll say that in a second. Okay? The longer your telomeres are when you're born, the longer your life expectancy is. And there's some interesting experimental evidence that shows that. Okay, kind of cool stuff. Well, unless you have short telomeres. All right? Okay, now, uh, for anybody who's curious, by the way, I teach another class called Molecular Medicine. The topic this week is actually this subject right here. We're talking about longevity. If any of you would like to see the webpage that I've got a whole bunch of stuff uh, up for that, send me an email and I'll make sure that you, you get a chance to take a look at it because there's some very interesting things that's happening right now with respect to longevity and telomeres and DNA replication. Some very, very exciting things. Okay, well, the longer the telomere, the better off you are. Unfortunately, your telomeres do not grow as you grow. What you've got shortly after you're born is pretty much what you're stuck with. Okay? That means the telomere has to be put onto those cells starting when, with fertilization. And when we look in a fertilized egg, we discover a very cool and interesting DNA polymerase. It's called telomerase. Not surprisingly, it makes telomeres. So telomerase makes telomeres. When we go looking around in cells for where we see telomerase, we don't find it in many places. We find it in gametes. 
We find it in stem cells. And you might think, whoa, if I could just figure out how to turn on my telomerase, I would be able to live forever because now I can grow my telomeres and then I'll always have something that's there. So there's my, my solution for, for a long life. The problem being that the third type of cell we find it in are cancer cells. Now, cancer cells have to have that telomerase there because if they don't, what's going to happen? They're going to kill themselves. They're dividing rapidly. They would quickly run out of telomeres and when they run out of telomeres, they're dead. Now some of you are thinking, ah, oh, so the key to long life is not making telomerase active, it's actually making telomerase inactive. Because if I make telomerase inactive with a drug, I can stop a cancer cell. I find a telomerase inhibitor, I put it into cells that are forming a tumor, the cells will burn themselves out and die, and there are some experimental drugs in progress right now that are showing just that. So telomerase inhibitors are potential anti-cancer drugs because they stop the tumor cell from being able to replicate over and over because the telomeres chew themselves out. Okay? So telomerase and telomeres are very interesting um, uh, things in that respect. Now I'm going to show you how telomerase works in just a second, but before I do that, I'll take any questions that you might have uh, about this whole thing. Yes? No, no, I didn't say that. So if you have longer telomeres, it just, seem, it just means that you have more cycles that your cells can go through before they will die. It doesn't mean that you're any more prone to cancer, no. So, uh, which is good. You want to live a nice, long, healthy life. Uh, yes? How do cancer cells get telomerase in the first place? Yeah, so how do cancer cells get telomerase in the first place? First of all, telomerase is a gene that's in our genome. And the question is, well, why is it off in our regular cells and why is it on in a cancer cell? I don't have a good answer for it. Most people don't have a good answer, but the answer I will have for you is because it has to be on. If it didn't come on, okay, there's a lot of cells in your body right now that are potentially cancerous, but for whatever reason haven't been able to activate telomerase and they die out. So what you're looking for is a selection process that is actually selecting for those that have the ability to turn on telomerase. Yeah, bad story, huh? Selection's working against you there. Yes? So basically from that, I'm getting that, I was going to ask, is there any correlation between cell growth and telomerase being active? Is there any correlation between cell growth and telomerase being active? Um, that's a good question. Uh, there may be some. There may be some. Uh, but for the most part, uh, telomerase is, is not active. So the, the place where there was a, a bit of an exception, say skin cells, skin cells are, are very rapidly dividing, very rapidly being sloughed off, and they may be getting, for example, stem cells replenishing them, in which case they are basically feeding off of a cell that does have telomerase active. Once they differentiate, the telomerase is no longer active. So in a sense, yes, that is, that is possible. Yes? Very good, yeah. If you kill cancer, you're going to kill the stem cells. That would probably be a pretty bad career move, wouldn't it? Yeah. So you'd hope to target it. Targeting it is, um, is one of the, the, the real challenges in an awful lot of, of anti-cancer therapies. The more you can specifically target it for the cells you're after, the better off you are. But yes, over time, you, you would have some problem associated with that. Kabin. Yeah, are there markers that can separate cancer cells from regular cells? For certain cancers, yes, absolutely there are. Did I understand the question there? What? I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you repeat the question? Uh huh. Oh, are the, are the telomerases different in a cancer cell versus a regular cell? No, it's the same gene. Same gene. Yep. I misunderstood. Sorry. Okay. Well, telomerase has to do something that other DNA polymerases can't do. 
telomerase has to be able to replicate at the end of a DNA. How does it do it? Well, it turns out it cheats. Okay? It cheats. It carries its own uh, sequence to copy. So here's a sequence of uh, the end of a chromosome. And it's getting ready to be elongated by telomerase. Uh, by telomerase. Telomerase carries as part of its enzyme, it carries an RNA sequence. So telomerase is carrying a small circular, actually it's not circular, but a small RNA, all right, that looks like this guy. Okay? What happens is part of this sequence can pair with the three prime end of that linear DNA. The three prime end of that linear DNA can be extended by DNA polymerase, and so it is. So now we get an addition, in this case, of six base pairs, and then it slides. And we get six base pairs, and it slides. And we get six base pairs, and it slides. And we get six base pairs, and it slides. And so what I've just done is I've grown the three prime end of this thing multiple times, all with the same six base pair sequence. Okay, So now we see how those repeats actually get on there. That means that telomerase, first of all, is copying RNA, which means it is technically a reverse transcriptase. So DNA polymerases that can copy RNA are known as reverse transcriptases. I mentioned earlier that HIV has a reverse transcriptase. Question back here. Well, it varies from organ. This, this figure simply shows six. It's actually a, a sequence of seven base pairs, but this is just a schematic figure. Okay. All right. Now, we've made a long three prime end, but what about the five prime end? How do we make the five prime end? Anybody? Normal replication. All we have to do is lay down an RNA primer and we start going back this direction. So once we've made that long three prime in, we can prime and now go back the other way and make that guy. So this is how the telomere is made using tel uh, telomerase. Okay? It's copying an RNA template that it carries on itself. It is a reverse transcriptase, meaning it's copying RNA but making DNA. And as a consequence, the linear end of that chromosome is uh, extended. Yes, sir? This is an example of RNA where it has here. It shows a T. Actually, it is inaccurate. That actually is a U. Yeah. Good question. Everybody got it? Okay, good, cool. So, telomerase is a pretty cool enzyme and a pretty interesting enzyme. As you can imagine, it's being very intensely uh, studied. Um, I should point out that uh, the Nobel Prize last year for medicine uh, was given to uh, Liz Blackburn, among other people, uh, for her work, pioneering work, on studying telomerase uh, back in the, the 1980s and 90s. So, a uh, very important uh, topic. Okay. Well, I want to uh, turn our attention now from just simply DNA replication to uh, some of the considerations uh, about maintaining DNA. And when I talk about this, I'm talking uh, about basically controlling for damage. Damage to DNA is pretty uh, much of a problem for cells. If the damage is significant, we want the cell to basically commit suicide, and that's what it does with P53, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But I want to spend some time talking about some problems that can be, that can be fixed and some that can't be fixed. And one of the ones I'm getting ready to show you is one that cannot be fixed. It's a problem associated with a disease called Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder that results from um, a sort of an odd phenomenon that occurs in cells. The odd phenomenon occurs when sequences that are repeated are being copied. So you have some sequences in your DNA that um, have repeats. You can see the repeat here. CAG, 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 okay? 
They're called triplet repeats, meaning they have three nucleotides and it's repeated over and over and over. And you have some of these in some of your genes. In your cells, those sequences are copied just fine. The CAG, 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 you might have 10 of them along together. And those, you start with 10, you end up with 10. A person who has Huntington's disease has some problem that causes the strand to slip as it's being made. When the strand slips, we get something that looks just like this. And since we have repeats, when it slips, there's everything else can still pair up, which is what's happening here. Okay? So the top strand has slid backwards. It has left this region unpaired. And now the cell has got a problem. Okay? The problem is that when we go to, uh, in this case, look at this guy here. What, have we, what has happened with this with respect to the number of repeats that we have in the bottom strand compared to the top strand? There's fewer, right? It can go the other way in which, and this is the more common phenomenon, where when we, when we have the slippage occurring, the top one can actually, the, the, the other one can grow. So people who have Huntington's have slippage occurring, and as a consequence, their number of triplet repeats is varying corresponding to how many times it is replicated. Well, why do you care about this? Well, you care about this if this is in the coding region for an important protein, and it is. Because each time you change the number of triplets that are there, you are changing the number of occurrences of a specific amino acid. And what you've learned about the structure of proteins is when you start changing amino acids, what happens to the structure of the protein? Okay. So people with Huntington's disease um, have a very difficult time with it. The disease usually manifests itself in sort of uh, mid-adulthood, um, I should say mid-adulthood, mid middle age, okay, 30s to 40s. And when it starts to happen, there, there are mental uh, problems, there are neurological problems that happen with it, and there are physical problems that can happen as well. So you can imagine you start messing with proteins, you're going to have some very severe problems um, associated with that. It is uh, always fatal. Um, people typically tend to die of it in their 40s and their 50s. And the problem associated with that is that they have made it through reproductive age. So they have passed it on to their children. And that's one of the ways in which it uh, persists uh, is by the fact that people make reproductive age before um, the, uh, the problem manifests itself. Okay, so there's a DNA uh, damage that cannot be repaired. There are people very, very intensely working on this. One of my former colleagues I went to graduate school here uh, with, got a PhD at the same time, is uh, a researcher at the Mayo Clinic on this right now, and she's got some very interesting uh, work on that. Okay. Now, another phenomenon I want you to make, be, make you aware of with respect to DNA damage is the first example that you will have seen now of oxidation posing a problem. I've talked about reactive oxygen species, and I've talked about why these reactions of oxygen are a problem, but you haven't seen any examples. Now you can see up close and personal the first real problem with uh, that damage. This, mo this um, molecule right here is 8-oxoguanine. It, re it results from reaction of a reactive oxygen species with guanine in DNA. So 8-oxoguanine, though it doesn't look that different, actually can form base pairs with adenine. So if your DNA is damaged such that you have 8-oxoguanine present in it, when that DNA goes to replicate, what should have been a C is likely going to become an A. Because of this, you now know one specific mechanism for mutation. And it has nothing to do with making an error. It has to do with the chemistry of 8-oxoguanine. So reactive oxygen species are leading directly to mutation. The more mutation, the more likely you're going to activate a cancer gene that you don't want to have activated or inactivate a cancer gene that you need to have activated, and you're going to develop a tumor. Other reactions can occur to the nucleotides of DNA. Here's uh, one that shows adenine 
can, uh, by hydrolysis, lose its amine group. And when it does, it forms this molecule we've talked about before, but you haven't seen, called this base called hypoxanthine. Hypoxanthine looks like that. Not surprisingly, this is going to cause some problems in your DNA if it's not taken care of. Here's another problem. Here um, is a um, fairly uh, obnoxious compound called aflatoxin. Aflatoxin um, is actually activated by cytochrome P450 system. The cytochrome P450 system is a liver complex that's used to detoxify things. Sometimes in attempting to detoxify things, it toxifies things. And here's an example. So this is a compound that can be produced by uh, mold. And it's commonly found in mold in peanuts. And when that makes this compound, it cre the, when your body handles, when you eat aflatoxin, your liver converts aflatoxin B1 into a very active DNA modifying agent. That active DNA modifying agent will react with DNA simply by touching it. Okay? Notice this very tight ring right here. When this thing hits DNA, it will break this bond and link itself onto DNA. Real problem, because now you've got this big honking molecule that's sitting there on the DNA. The DNA polymerase, which is now nicely looking for A's, T's, G's, and C's, all of a sudden hits this, Ugh, what the heck is this? And it doesn't know what to do with it. It may try to take a guess. It may try to put something in. And if it does, it's frequently wrong. And so aflatoxin can lead to mutation as well. OK, well, we want to take care of things. We don't want to have these uh, problems come along and not be able to take care of them. I like to eat peanuts, for example. Okay. Well, I'll show you one or two more, and then I'll, I'll tell you about some mechanisms for taking care of it. Here's one that anybody uh, who's ever been in my class knows what I think of tanning booths. And if you don't, you should. Okay. Tanning booths are like taking up smoking. Okay. It just makes about as much sense at this point in your life to go to a tanning booth as it does to start smoking a cigarette because you're going to have the same sorts of problems associated with them. In cigarette smoke, you're getting compounds that will react with your DNA like aflatoxin. And when you're going to a tanning booth, you're getting nice little UV rays that are joining together your thymine residues. They're called thymine dimers. What they are are covalent bonds that are formed between two thymines that are next to each other on the same strand. So it's a covalent bond between two thymines that are next to each other on the same strand. Okay? This causes, not surprisingly, the DNA to be misshapen at that point. It causes the DNA polymerase to have a pretty big problem when it goes to try to replicate it. And yes, it can lead to mutation and lead to skin cancer. Okay? So we want to be able to deal with thymine dimers as well. Okay? A lot of different things, a lot of different kinds of, of damage that can happen to DNA. We want to be able to take care of all of them. Okay. We fortunately do have a way of taking care of thymine dimers, so it's not like you should 100% uh, avoid the sun, but it means you shouldn't overload it with a tanning booth. Last, here is an agent called sorolin. Sorolin is a, an agent that will cross-link. That is, it will bind to one portion of DNA, and then it will bind to another portion of the DNA, and in the middle it will be okay, holding the two together. Sorolin is used in the laboratory to study uh, things that bind to DNA, and it's used for that very purpose. It's kind of a tether to hold on to something. One side binds to one side, the other side binds to the other side. This is a pretty nasty compound, too, and something I'll tell you that you probably don't know is celery is full of this stuff. I love celery, okay? But celery is full of this stuff. Okay, now let's talk about fixing some of these problems. Well, one of these I've already talked about already, and that relates to proofreading, okay? Proofreading occurs as a result, I'll remind you, of a, an activity that's found on the DNA polymerase. It's a three prime to five prime exonuclease activity. A three prime to five prime exonuclease activity. Now somebody asked me when I talked about that activity in class, 
Does it chew out that base as soon as it makes a mistake or a little bit after? Okay. Well, as this figure shows you, it occurs pretty quickly, but it actually takes a little bit of time because the missed base actually has to make it down to this other site. So there's a couple bases that goes by before it can actually peel off. And you might say, well, why does it go down here? Why does it even go down at all? And the answer is that you've got a bulge right there where the missed base is. And that bulge destabilizes the DNA and causes this breathing that I talked about uh, previously, the breathing to allow that strand to come off, go down, and be chewed off. And that's what you see happening in this proofreading mechanism, the 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity. Okay, so proofreading is pretty straightforward. That takes care of mistakes. That has nothing to do with damage, but it's pretty good at taking care of mistakes as the DNA polymerase is moving along. What happens if the uh, polymerase makes an error, but the proofreader doesn't catch it in the first place? How do we deal with that? Okay, how do we deal with that? Well, E. coli has a system that's shown on the screen, and we have a system that's very much like it called DNA mismatch repair. DNA mismatch repair. In E. coli, the process starts by a recognition by a protein that something is mispaired. So our cells have proteins that go scanning along the DNA looking for bulges, looking for problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In E. coli, that's pretty simple because the, pro the DNA is not covered by protein. In our cells, that's a lot more of a problem because we've got histones that are wrapped around there. Okay. The protein that's doing the scanning is known as MUTS. M-U-T-S. Okay? Now, MUTS, what it will do is when it encounters a mismatch, as we see here, a GT mismatch, it stops. And when it stops, that provides a cue for the next protein in the system called MUTL to bind to MUTS. And all that MUTL does is it provides a bridge between MUTS and the next protein, which is called MUTH. Now, mute H catalyzes clipping of a bond and then excision back. Okay? Clipping of the bond and then excision back. So mute H actually has to be an endonuclease and an exonuclease. It has to be an endo in that sense that it's not starting at an end, it's making a clip in the middle, and then it's chewing back. Okay? Now, once it's chewed that back, DNA polymerase can come back along and fill it in. Now, notice in this case, we're actually using DNA polymerase 3, not polymerase 2, which is associated with many repair systems, but instead we're using DNA polymerase 3. Now polymerase comes along and says, oh, I didn't get it right the first time. I'll get it right this time. It's put a C in and it's set. Okay, everybody got that? Yes, Megan. How does it know which strand? Oh, good. I'm glad you asked that question. How does it know which strand? I mean, why didn't it start down here and do the other one? We look at it, oh, the top one's the good one, right? There's no top or bottom in the cell. How does the cell know which one is the right strand? Okay. What's that? Flip a coin? So if it flips a coin, then it's going to be right half the time, it's going to be wrong half the time, and it's still going to have a mutational problem. Turns out it's got a, very, it's got a better system, and it's very cool. All right? This you won't have to know for the exam. I'll just tell you, so you can relax for a minute. Okay. So the system it uses is a system of methylation. Okay? Methylation means putting a methyl group onto something. Now it turns out that E. coli have um, a methylation system that whenever it sees the sequence GATC, it puts a methyl on the A. Okay? Puts a methyl on the A. Well, GATC, if you go this way, if you read it back, is also GATC that way, right? GATC pairs with, right? Everybody figure that out? GATC that way is also GATC that way. That means 
that over time, both strands get methylated. The A in the top strand, the A in the bottom strand get methylated. All right? When replication occurs, and this guy has been recently replicated because I said the polymerase made a mistake, right? Replication occurs. Notice we have a blue strand and a black strand. The black strand was the parental strand. And the cell can tell it was the parental strand by virtue of the fact that its GATCs have methyls on them. This guy hasn't had a chance to have methyls put onto it yet. And the cell knows this is the strand to cleave because this was the one that was wrongly copied. Pretty cool system. Now, we have a similar system. It involves CGs. Uh, but it's, it's, it's simpler, but it's also more complex. Yes, question? OK. You guys are reading my mind here. This is getting scary. You probably don't want to know. OK. All right, I'll make a deal with it. I'll do one more, and then we'll call, it, we'll call it an exam. How's that? I won't talk about P53 on this exam. I'll talk about it for next exam. All right. The last one I want to talk about for this exam um, is a uh, repair process called nucleotide excision repair. Okay, Nucleotide excision repair. Now, nucleotide excision repair happens when we've had some significant damage to DNA. This particular one is showing a thymine dimer. It could be a DNA base that has been damaged chemically in some way. Okay. Whatever it is, the cell has recognized that there's something wrong. It's a bulge because there's a dimer. There's a bulge because there's a chemical there that shouldn't be there or whatever. But there's a bulge right there where there shouldn't be um, for, for a, a, a variety of reasons. OK, well, your body has um, a set of proteins um, called UVRABC that recognize this and clip it out. Just like we saw before, these are called exinucleases in, that, in the sense that they are uh, both cutting out, um, they're both cutting on both sides of this thing and then removing this uh, segment. Okay? It's an exinuclease because it's cutting on both sides and removing the segment. That leaves a gap like we saw before. Now DNA polymerase 1, in this case, comes along, fills in, ta da! Ligase comes along, and we've repaired the damage. Now, that means, therefore, that you go to the, I can go to the tanning booth now, right? I can go to the tanning booth and get, and get all the dimers I want because I have a system to fix it. And maybe not. The number of these okay, is going to determine how efficiently you repair those. If you go out and you really bake yourself, what you're going to do in baking yourself is, as you're going to do in a tanning booth, is you're going to overload the ability of the system to fix these, and therefore you're going to favor mutation. Okay, so you don't want to overload the system. You don't want to cause any more of these than necessary. Just like you don't want to take a little bit of aflatoxin. Okay, it's not a good idea, right? So you don't want to favor any mutation when necessary. So you want to work with the system. The system is there to help you, protect you. Uh, and hopefully not let you uh, overdo what you would otherwise tend to do. Okay, I think that's enough for this exam. Uh, exam will cover through right there, and uh, we will pick up the rest of it on Wednesday. See you guys then. Jessica. Yeah, how are you? Good. Um, so I have a question about telomeres. Yeah. Do they see, like, if you were to analyze telomeres like some sort of neural cell versus like a stomach like, you know? Yep. Are the cells at the higher turnover rate going to have much shorter telomeres? It's, it's a little complicated. And the reason it's complicated is because stem cells do jump into the picture. When you have cells that are rapidly turning over, like skin cells or something, they're being replenished by stem cells. So it, it's it, it, a rapidly turning over one is going to have more feeding by the stem cells. So I paint a simple picture so that you can understand what's going on. But the phenomenon is real. If you look at an, cells of an older person from whatever tissue, you will see that their telomeres are shorter than that of a younger person. Yeah. It is odd, yeah. Fountain of youth.